Welcome back uh, to our final lecture on distributive justice. So we've seen Nozick's approach, um, right, which is uh, basically if you got what you got fair and square, right, which is according to the rules of acquisition, um, then you're entitled to it. And if everyone's entitled to what they have, then we have a just distribution. Um, Rawls had a different approach. Rawls thought, well, we can start with a kind of social contract theory, but we put everyone behind a veil of ignorance so they don't know, you know, what sort of person they are and whatever distribution gets agreed on, uh, that will be adjusted. Nussbaum is going to question the entire approach to what sorts of things should be distributed. Right? We have been assuming that the things that we distribute are, you know, what Nozick called holdings, so money or other valuables. Uh, Nussbaum says, no, that's not actually the sort of thing that we should be concerned Contributing in a just system. Instead, she argues for something called capabilities. So she is did not invent this notion of the capability. She's sort of engaging with um, the work of uh, Dr. Sen. Sen starts by sort of criticizing utilitarian approaches to justice, um, and he's got a sort of focused on gender inequality. Um, he thinks it sort of reveals some of the problems with uh, utilitarian approaches to justice. And as we'll see, Nussbaum also is uh, concerned with issues of gender, right? So this is, um, ultimately the approach will be broader, right? Than just focusing on gender inequality, but it's a way to reveal some of the problems with other theory. So let's suppose that we had a, a utilitarian approach to distributive. Um, and so we want, might want to maximize <clears throat> utility, right? And if we thought that, uh, money is a kind of a useful uh, proxy for utility, right? If you're trying to, um, it's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So more money will make you happier to a degree. That's uh, kind of been empirically proven, right? Beyond a certain amount for the very rich, more money is not gonna make them much more happy. Uh, but if you're trying to run you know, a government and distribute things fairly, uh, a utilitarian could do worse than just to say, let's say, the amount of money you have equals the amount of happiness. Well, the problem with that would be that uh, there are lots of people who are not sort of contributing to you know, gross domestic product that aren't generating money, right? But are nonetheless um, important workers, right? In the economy, for example, women who work in the home. And, you know, there's also gonna, so that, if we're trying to maximize uh, general happiness in terms of, you know, utility and thinking of utility in terms of money, it just overlooks like large segments of the population. Right? Um, so Sen introduces this notion of capabilities uh, as the things that can be distributed instead of money, right? Um, and the idea is we're focused on what opportunities exist for people to do and be what they want, right? um, whether or not that generates money or requires money. There's a few reasons to uh, prefer capabilities over um, other approaches. So one problem with a utilitarian approach justice, if we, <clears throat> let's for the moment go back to utilitarianism as maximizing happiness, right? Rather than using money as a proxy for happiness. Um, people tend to say they're happy no matter how objectively bad their life is, right? And this is uh, what we call the phenomenon of adapted, adaptive preferences, right? So, um, you know, certain people's lives are sort of limited. And if you ask them, you survey them, um, they're, gonna re they're gonna report their happiness sort of relative to what they conceive as even possible, right? So, you know, here's a happy coal miner, right? If you think, okay, my life is, you know, mining coal, which is a, dangerous and difficult job, right? But if you think, well, that's sort of the limit of my possibilities, then you'll say, yeah, you know, within that context, I'm pretty happy, right? Um, so they've, you've adapted your preferences to fit the options you have, but in a, in a larger, more objective sense, you may not actually be uh, as happy as you could be. Um, another issue that needs to be addressed when we talk about um, distributive justice is the notion of equality, right? We do, you know, 
involved, wanted sort of equal rights for, for everyone, equal distribution of rights and so on. Um, some people might s look for some sort of equality in their distributions, right, of, of, of holdings. But you have to ask what, what we mean by equality, right? So, um, for example, let's suppose that you thought uh, a just distribution would be just everybody has the exact same amount of money, right, kind of a communist approach. Well, the problem is um, different people are still starting at different places, right? So someone who is relatively healthy um, doesn't have to spend a lot of money on, you know, medical care or, you know, on a wheelchair and so on. They're going to be able to do more with that amount of money than someone who's going to have to use a large proportion of it, right, to just um, deal with their health issues, right? So equal wealth is not necessarily equal sort of possibilities or opportunities or outcomes, right, depending on your, where you're starting out. Are we trying to distribute, if it's not health, we're trying to distribute equally, but instead maybe happiness. Again, we've got this issue of adaptive preferences. Right? Are we measuring this happiness? Is it just to how people report it? And is someone, you know, who's a relatively happy coal miner, are they really as happy as a relatively happy billionaire, right? Um, it's also difficult to, to get equality in that sense. So, San offers, a different approach. The thing that we want to distribute equally is capabilities, right? Um, so a capability doesn't sort of tell you what to do with your life, and it doesn't make any assumptions about what you value. If you value money or happiness or making work apart, whatever you value, um, Sen says you should have the capability to obtain the things you want, whatever that might be. Right? And Note, right, if we're distributing capabilities instead of money, then that would mean that someone who has, you know, health issues, they're going to have to get a little bit more, right, in order to bring them up to the level of someone who was born relatively healthy, right? You know, if one person needs a wheelchair and it costs whatever, $1,000, okay, with a capabilities approach, give them the extra $1,000, right, because that's what they need to uh, come up to equal capabilities with someone who doesn't need that wheelchair. So talking about capabilities can sometimes sound a lot like talk about um, So some of the things we consider rights, the right to free association, the right to vote, the right to you know choose your own occupation, um, those are also capabilities. Uh, but there are we will see there is an important difference between having the capability to vote and having the right to vote. Um, and there are the typically the talk about rights uh, tends to favor these sort of public things like voting and speech, right? And tends to ignore um, more private rights like freedom from violence in the home, right? That's not a right in the in the Constitution, uh, and it's something that women often suffer, right? Is is violence in the home? Uh, so the move to the talk about capabilities is in part a hope to, to refocus and allow uh, for a broader conception of what as a right or a capability. So Nussbaum has a lot to say about rights, you know, and why we should instead talk about capabilities right rather than rights. So one question is what is the basis of our rights? What gives us these innate rights that we believe we have? Right? So I have um, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right, as in the Declaration of Independence. Why do I have that? Um, and for example, a pig does not, right? What is, what is the difference? Is it my rationality? Is it by merely being human? Um, is it merely being alive? Well, then that wouldn't distinguish me from a pig, right? Um, are we born with our rights, like independent of any political system we're born into? Or are they the result of having the right kind of political system that gives us our rights? Um, is it only individual people that have rights or do groups also have rights? Uh, if I have a right to vote, does that entail a duty on someone else or the government, for example, to make it possible for me to vote? Or do I simply have the right whether or not I'm actually able to do the thing? Uh, these are all you know, problems that Nussbaum doesn't uh, propose to answer, right? She's just pointing out all the ambiguities and maybe someone could try to answer them. But she says, 
understanding, instead shifting to the notion of capacities, um, helps us understand the nature of these all rights. So she she argues that a right to X to do whatever to vote right requires a capacity to do X right. So just because I write it into the Constitution that I have the right to vote doesn't mean that I have the capacity or the capability um, to do it right. So for example, in the South, right, uh, black people technically had the right to vote right. But oftentimes they didn't have the capability to vote, right? Either, you know, the only available voting place was like far away, right? During hours that the person is trying to work. Sometimes they had like literacy requirements and stuff. So, um, or other sorts of requirements that effectively prevented black people from voting in the South. Right? Uh, so a right to vote doesn't entail the ability to vote. Can't get to the polling place. Um, Capability is a bit, right? In, ensuring someone's capabilities in the Constitution would be a stronger, right, thing that says, okay, government is required to make sure that you can actually do the thing. So, a right, you know, understood as a capability entails not just that you can't stop someone from doing it, but that you're required to make it actually possible. Is often understood in terms of negative and positive freedom, right? So the United States Constitution uh, tends to frame things in terms of negative liberties. So you know, Congress shall make no law prohibiting free exercise of religion. No state shall deprive us deprive a citizen of life, liberty, and property without due process. So these are negative rights in that they are things that the government can't are not allowed to do to you. Right? But it doesn't really talk about things that you are guaranteed to be able to do. Um, so you might have certain rights that are just made impossible on a practical level, right? Even though technically no one can stop you from doing it, the situation might be such that you are not allowed to. You can Nussbaum contrast this with the Indian Constitution, which was uh, created a bit later than the United States Constitution and has a different approach in it and does in fact um, phrase things more sort of in terms of capabilities or something you might interpret it as. Um, it tends to frame things not in terms of limits on what the state can do, but obligations that the state has to ensure right, that its citizens have certain exercise. And again, she thinks the you know the tendency towards things, negative liberties as we do in the United States has had created problems for women um, because it's tended to an Im implicitly separate the public from the private, right? So the government is not allowed to do certain things you know in a public way, but the government is not really um, interfering in private life and what goes on in the home, and many of the problems for women happen in the home, right? So Nussbaum argues that if we were to frame, you know, a just society in terms of capacity, capabilities, I, I sort of use capabilities and capacities interchangeably. Um, you know, making it clear that we are we are owed the ability to actually do some of the things we want, um, which is you know more than just saying the government can't interfere. I mean, the government is obligated to help you uh, get the things that you you need want. She argues that would be better for women, and you know, probably for anyone. There's also the issue of a certain amount of Eurocentrism that uh, comes with rights. So definitely, you know, the United States Con Constitution came out of is highly influenced by John Locke, who's an Enlightenment era thinker. He's British, you know. Um, so the, the Enlightenment, if you're not familiar, so this was. Uh, you know, 1600s, 1700s in Europe, where uh, you really saw a big shift from a religious worldview to a more secular worldview. Uh, and there was a lot of, you know, instead of sort of the, the king being a representative of God, right, and being divinely ordained and, and that sort of thing, instead you started to have elected officials 
who were largely independent church and, and religion. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, that was a, many think a, a big step forward in, in, in the thought and an and approach to government in, in Europe. Um, but it came along with this talk of rights, right? And other um, parts of the world that developed in different ways didn't necessarily uh, talk about rights quite so much. Um, and if we shift to capabilities, Nussbaum argues uh, an approach to distributive justice will be compatible with a wider variety of political tradition. You don't, you, it'll end up that you can't only have justice in kind of an American style democracy. There can be other types of governments that can also. Um, and in general, the capabilities approach, it's just trying to make it clear that we're only ensuring opportunities opportunities for people to do what they want. We're not gonna force anyone to do anything, right? So you, if you have the capability for free speech, it doesn't mean you have to say what you want, right? You can stay quiet if you want. You have the capability to vote, doesn't mean you have to vote and so on. So <clears throat> that's the general, right? Um, and it's sort of, Stepping back, I think it makes sense, right, to say, okay, yeah, we can, we have a lot of rights, um, and we can't necessarily always exercise them, right? And yeah, it makes sense that, you know, handing out money in a fair way doesn't ensure that everyone will actually be able to get what they want out of life if they're born with certain, you know, disabilities or other uh, impediments, right? But a certain amount of money will get one person much farther than than another person, right? So. In both those senses, with rights and with distribution of resources, it seems like framing in terms of capabilities uh, fixes some problems with the. So, what are the capabilities that ought to be insured? Um, so, Nussbaum offers us a you know a provisional list. She's open to it being changed, right? Um, but she wants to focus, you know, in building this list. It's she's got reasons for choosing these particular capabilities that she thinks are the central ones. And it starts with the assumption that human life has a certain kind of dignity. Uh, and in order to live up to that level of dignity, you have to have certain capabilities. And she thinks there are 10 capabilities that are a necessary condition for a human life that has um, requisite dignity. Um, and any human society that does not guarantee those capabilities cannot be called a just society. Uh, she has 10 capabilities, and she thinks that they have to be insured for every single person, right? Not just for a few or not just for the average person. Every person in the society has to have these 10 capabilities in order for that society to be considered. Here are the central human capacities. Number one, life, right? So you should be able to live to the end of a human life of normal length without dying from early or uh, before your life is so reduced living um, you know obviously there have to be limitations on this just by the laws of physics and nature right so if someone until we cure cancer right uh, not everyone is going to live to the end of a human life of normal length right but at any rate um, the government should ensure that you have the best possible uh, opportunity Number the health, you should be able to have good health, including reproductive health, to be adequately nourished, to have adequate shelter, right? This is fairly, um, uh, you know, progressive, right? We certainly in our country are not guaranteed food and shelter. There are programs to help people, but there are certainly people that fall through the cracks, right? So not everyone in the United States has shelter, right? There are some 650,000 homeless people out there. So she thinks that this should be a basic without which you don't get to live. You aren't living a life with adequate dignity, and, and, and so that such a society would not be just. So it seems like she's saying um, our society is not just. Number three, bodily integrity. So being able to move freely from place to place, to be secure against violent assault, including sexual assault and domestic violence, having opportunities for sexual satisfaction and for choice in matters of reproduction. So, um, 
yeah, this is being allowed to do what you want with your body. That having opportunities for sexual satisfaction is interesting. It sounds some some kind of like a right to sex. Uh, that has been a question that has been debated among philosophers. Wouldn't frame it in terms of rights, right? And to think that being able to express yourself sexually will be part of life. These ones, they, they start to get longer and longer, these basic capacities. So number four, uh, senses, imagination, and thought. So you should be able to use your senses, to be able to imagine, to think, to reasons, to reason, and to do things in a truly human way, which means a way informed and cultivated by an adequate education, right? So the key here, I mean, obviously no one can yet um, invade your mind and prevent you from being or thinking, right? Uh, but Nussbaum here is arguing that to think in a fully human way, you need education, right? So you must, must have the capability to be educated adequately so that you can, you know, you need to take critical thinking, right? And that needs to be provided for you. Um, you know, being able to use your imagination and thought in connection with experiencing and producing works and events of your own choice, religious, literary, musical, and so forth, right? So part of thinking and using your senses and your imagination is, you know, engaging in religious experiences, music, whatever, it might be, and you should have the capability to do that. Um, so that would, the right to freedom of religion would be covered by this capacity for senses, imagination, and thought. And also among those sensations is pleasure and pain. So you should have the capability to experience pleasure, even avoid pain, not beneficial, right? Up if you need uh, surgery, right? Or if you need, you know, exercising is painful, right? But it's also beneficial, right? I'm not saying no one should ever feel any pain, right? But you should have the opportunity to avoid it, right? So you should have access to painkillers, right? If you, uh, you know, have a terrible... Number five, the emotions. So you should be able to have attachments to things and people outside of yourself, to love those who love and care for you, to grieve at their absence. In general, to love, grieve, to experience longing, gratitude, and justify anger. Um, again, you might think, well, yeah, no one can is sort of getting into my brain and sort of like turning off my emotions. But there are many situations in life where you're not allowed to sort of be as an emotional being as you'd like, right? If you're at work, um, you have to sort of put a cap on your emotions, often when you're in school as well. Um, and you also need certain sorts of relationships in order to develop your emotional life. So, um, it's not just merely uh, having the right to not have your brain in, invaded or limited, but the right to engage in activities uh, so that you can have a healthy emotional life. Number six, practical reason. Uh, being able to form a conception of the good, engage in critical reflection about planning one's life, right? include uh, religious thoughts. So, Practical reason is sort of just, uh, well, what a thing, right? I think, geez, I'd like to uh, own a home, uh, so what sh I'll need to make a certain amount of money to do that. What sort of jobs would make that amount of money? Oh, I could be a lawyer. Okay, then I'm going to go to law school. Practical reason. You have a goal and think about what you need to do in order to achieve the goal, right? So whatever your goal is, if it's not owning a house, but instead is having, you know, lots of friends, right? Or instead is having, you know, 2.5 children or whatever your good is, um, you should have the freedom to be able to, to reason about that and to plan your life accordingly, right? For you, a good life is uh, having a particular religious faith, then you should be able to engage in reasoning about that. Seven, uh, capacity for affiliation. This is like the freedom of association in the in rights talk, right? Um, it's the ability to come together with other human beings for various purposes. Being able to live with and toward others, recognize and show concern for other human beings, engage in various forms of social interaction, be able to imagine the situation of other, and also have the social basis of self-respect on humiliation. So there needs to be this capability entails non-discrimination on the basis of race, race, sex, sexual orientation. That means you should be able to identify as whatever sort of being you are, right? If you identify as gay, 
you should be able to do that. You should be able to affiliate with, you know, gayness, other gay people, um, and be able to do that without discrimination and so on. So, you know, if you want to join a communist group, if you want to join a right wing group, uh, you should be able to do that. Capability for affiliation. Number eight, other species. So this is not uh, equal rights for animals, right? This is about humans, but part of being human is being able to live with concern for and in relation to animals, plants, and nature. So um, if you care about animals, you should be able to have a um, do that to care for animals. Right? Number Right, so we need to have the capability to play. We can't just work all the time. We need to be able to laugh, to enjoy recreational activities. Um, we currently have the right to do that, but do we always have the capability to do that? Right, if you're working, a, you know, a 12-hour day, and then have children, you have to care for. Um, what would be required from the government to give you the capability to play? Right, you might need more childcare. You might need a better wage. You might need more time off work. And finally, number 10, control over one's environment. So she breaks this up into two different types of control. Political control means being able to participate in the political choices that govern your life, right? So more than just the right to vote, right? But you have the right of political participation, free speech, and all of that, but also the capability to actually affect change. And then material control over your environment. So this is sort of the right to property, but in capabilities talk. So you should be able to have the capability to hold have property, be it you know a car or a house. Um, equally with others, you have equal rights to other people. Um, you have an equal right to seek employment, right? There shouldn't be certain jobs that are cut off from certain segments of society. Uh, you should have the freedom from the government coming in and taking your stuff. And in work, you should be able to work as a human being uh, entering into meaningful relationships, exercising practical reason, right? So you can't just be, for all intents and purposes, a robot on an assembly line, right? That's not dignity, of course. Okay, so those are the 10 capabilities, right, that she thinks should be basic, and she thinks that, you know, a society based on those capabilities would be more just than one that simply goods, you know, according to some formula, or which ensures certain basic right. She wants to reiterate that she thinks that um, these capabilities are compatible with a lot. These are not just sort of Eurocentric, but that um, pluralistic, meaning that many different types of cultures and political systems are compatible with this capability to, to justice. Um, first of all, she thinks that this list is open-ended, it could be revised, right? Maybe there's not 10, maybe there's nine, maybe there's 12, maybe there's 20, right? Uh, basic capabilities. Second, she's trying to frame these capabilities as abstractly as possible so that they could be, you know, adapted in another society, right? Whatever your relationship with animals is in the United States, it could be something different for example, in the Hindu culture where many people believe in reincarnation, uh, Maybe your relationship with animals is different, and she wants to leave that. Right? Third, she tries to um, frame the capacities in a way that doesn't commit to any particular metaphysical conception of the world. You don't need to believe in God or not believe in God. Uh, you don't need to. If you think the world is flat, right, you should still have this capability stuff. Fourth, um, capabilities and actual functioning are different, right? And so, you know, if you're an Amish person and you don't want to engage in technology, right, you don't want to exercise all of your capabilities, um, you're not, shouldn't be forced to or required to, right? Your actual function can fall short. Um, some of these capabilities are specifically there to preserve pluralism, right? So freedom of association. Um, the idea there is like, okay, I want, you know, I want to identify as gay or as a Hindu or as, um, you know, any number of things, right? As a communist or a libertarian, uh, the point of that freedom of association is to have a pluralistic world where many people can have different worldviews. Next, um, 
she wants to re make it clear that even if she's right, and these are the necessary capacities, and even if there are other societies or cultures that do not ensure those, that doesn't mean we can like invade their country and force them to ability, right? Um, all you can do is persuade, right? So we certainly have the right to talk to, you know, other cultures and try to convince them that they abilities. So, as I said, you know, she um, Sen sort of invented the idea of capabilities as the as the thing to be distributed. Nussbaum is developing it here. She has a few problems with Sen's approach that she thinks is improving. So, uh, Sen invented the notion of the capabilities and included them in an account of justice. But he actually made them only a part of it, right? And and certain freedoms Sen thought were more important than capabilities. Um, Nussbaum doesn't like that approach because freedoms tend to be inherently in tension with each other, right? So uh, I've got the freedom, you know, to vote, but also uh, Jeff Bezos has the freedom to uh, donate whatever he wants to any political candidate, and that's typically going to outweigh my vote, right, as a single middle person, right? So yeah, me and me and Jeff Bezos both have the same freedoms, but given that he's super rich, uh, he's going to pretty much squash any of my attempts to influence the world. Um, so if you're going to talk about freedoms, you need an account of which freedoms should be preserved, which ones can be infringed for the sake of other freedoms, right? Just, you know, my freedom to bodily integrity is going to butt up against someone else's freedom of movement. You know, the freedoms will clash, right? Um, so we need to figure out how to work those out. Um, you know, the freedom to pollute the environment uh, maybe shouldn't be preserved, the freedom to assault your wife, right? Certain freedoms need to be limited or eliminated. Um, you know, there's, should I have the freedom to ride a motorcycle without a helmet if the only person I'm helping is my, hurting is myself? Um, I don't know, we do have helmet laws, but are, are those just, uh, it's hard to say, you know, it's open to debate, right? And then there's other freedoms like freedom of speech and religion that, Nussbaum would argue are are essential. So uh, freedoms are, are tricky. Um, Nussbaum seems to think that all these problems with freedoms bumping into each other don't arise for capacities. But is that the case? That I'll leave that up to you to think about. Right? Um, could my capabilities right infringe on your capabilities um, or not? Um, you know, are are these capacities, capabilities really different from or superior to freedoms or rights, or are we really just saying the same thing in different words? Um, you've still got time. If, if you find this interesting and you want to write a paper that argues that they're not actually that different, that could be interesting. Right. Um, and it's interesting to think about, you know, to what degree she's compatible or incompatible with Nozick or with Rawls. A couple more things to say about capabilities and then we'll, and then we'll end. So one advantage of Nussbaum's view is it guarantees capacities to, to being that can't enter into a social contract, right? like children, non-human animals, and people with certain disabilities, right? So again, it's based on human dignity. So so far as children are human, um, they're going to have their, um, these capabilities should be guaranteed to them, right? We don't have to worry about the fact that children can't enter into social contracts. Non-human animals are not human, right? They don't have this human dignity, so she's relying on humans' uh, tendency to, to coexist with animals in a, in a respectful relationship um, to preserve whatever capabilities non-human animals need to have. Right? And also people with disabilities who, you know, in a social contract, you might say, well, I'm not going to give up any of my rights to protect myself from uh, people, you know, with certain disabilities because I don't think they can harm me. So, uh, but on Nussbaum's approach, in virtue of being human, right, everyone should be abilities. It just so happens that traditionally women have been statistically the ones who tend to care for children, people with disabilities. Um, so she thinks this the capabilities approach is a feminist approach. Right? These capability if women have had the job of ensuring capabilities for children and for uh, people with disabilities, and if instead this is the government's job, right, this frees up women. Um, social contracts 
also assume equality among the people who form the contract, but that's an ideal world. That's nice. But in real life, um, it's not like that. We're born very dependent on other people, right? Babies are just not equal to adults, right? In many respects, um, we die very dependent on others. And in the middle, some of us are and some of us aren't, right? So just assuming that every human is just equal um, in all their abilities is just not true, right? Um, if a social contract theorist is assuming independent, perfectly rational, self interested people, um, when in fact, humanity is much more diverse than that, how are they ever going to guarantee, right? A, a, all of us at some point are gonna fall outside of that group of perfectly rational and independent. All right, and finally, right, so she began with this notion of inherent dignity, right? Um, deserved by human life, right? But you may be interested in the, often students are interested in the, in the issue of animal rights. Um, what do you think? Does Nussbaum's approach adequately defend animal rights or you know animal capabilities? Um, is there a certain dignity, if there's a dignity of being human, is there a basic dignity of being a living being, right? Um, and what would that look like? That might be interesting to discuss in the discussion group. If you want to write a paper on it at this point. All right, so that is the Nussbaum. Um, that is sort of the final uh, lecture on, on material from this course. I, I will post a, on Wednesday a bit of a review about uh, what to expect on the final. Right? Um, but thank you all for all your diligent work and, and all your great discussion. And um, we start to finish up in the last uh, couple of weeks. So I will.